Well, welcome to Naturals 101 webinar. Um, we're so excited that we have all of you joining us this evening um, for our first um, version of Naturals 101 um, this webinar. So please be patient with us if we have any technical difficulties this evening, but um, thank you for taking the time and joining us here. We're so excited that Stan Rogers, the superintendent of Grace Reef, is going to share um, some wonderful facts about this jewel that we have here off our coast. Um, here at 100 miles, you know how important all 100 miles plus some is to us. So we're going to get started here in just a minute. Um, we are gonna do questions and answers at the end, um, but if you wanna add anything to the chat so you don't forget it during it, please, and I can do those. And we'll also turn, we'll allow you to turn on your um, mics and videos too at the end. So if you actually wanna ask those questions, while it is going, please feel free to do that. Also, if you have any issues during this time, please email alex at 100miles.org and she's our technical support, so she's there too. Um, but without any further ado, let me please introduce Stan Rogers. He is the current superintendent of Grace Reef, but he has been with NOAA for um, I think about four years. You can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but he came, he's been the superintendent since last August. So you're not here to hear me, so let me turn it over to Stan. And thank you so much for doing this for us. <laughs> you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you all for attending. This is uh, interesting times we live in, to say the least. So I'm, I'm so happy that uh, we can adjust and, and do this virtually. Uh, it would be great to be able to see everyone in person and, and get to know you. Um, but perhaps tonight we can, we can share a little bit and I, I welcome any questions or thoughts that you have uh, as you see the presentation. So. Um, yeah, tonight, uh, the wonders of Gray's Reef. I just wanted primarily to um, reintroduce Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary to uh, a lot of you. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've, um, you know a little bit, but hopefully you'll learn a, f a few things uh, tonight during this presentation. Um, I'm sure I'll, I will learn a few things as well. Um, I think we may have actually a couple of our, a uh, few of our staff on the line as well from Gray's Reef. So um, if some super technical questions pop up, I may defer to some of those folks later on. So, uh, but I'll do my best to answer questions. And you know, I, I just look forward to hearing your thoughts as well. Uh, again, so this is gonna be a little bit of an overview of Gray's Reef, a little bit about how we manage uh, the sanctuary, uh, but also some, some neat pictures and uh, a little bit of video as well. So you can actually get a little sense of what Gray's Reef looks like that's that's what everybody wants to see so um, I will we'll go ahead and get started um, hopefully everyone can see this if you can please let me know um, this is a map of our sanctuary system so Grace Reef National Marine Sanctuary is part of a system of 14 uh, National Marine Sanctuaries around the United States and its territories um, and as well, there are two na uh, marine national monuments uh, that make up the system. So as you can see on the map, uh, Gray's Reef is off the coast of Sapelo Island, uh, Georgia. And uh, interestingly, it is the only um, sanctuary uh, of its kind, a marine protected area of, of its kind, between uh, the outer banks of North Carolina and the Key, Florida Keys. So. Uh, and this important part of our coast is South Atlantic Bight. Um, Gray's Reef is a, is a marine protected area that helps us to understand and learn more about what, what's going on off our coast and how important these resor resources are to people. Um, so as you can see on the map, Gray's Reef is not a huge area. It's 22 square miles. Um, but those 22 square miles are, are very important as they are, they are really representative of a key habitat type that extends from uh, Cape Hatteras to Cape Canaveral, Florida. Uh, this live bottom or hard bottom habitat that we'll be talking about. So again, very important habitat. Um, Gray's Reef has sort of been a mixing zone influenced by the, the rivers and estuaries of, of the coast of Georgia and the Carolinas. Uh, and it is also influenced by offshore currents including the Gulf Stream. So quite an quite a interesting location. And perhaps that might be some of the reasons that it's so diverse and it's such an amazing place. So let's talk a little bit about Gray's Reef. Here's a little Moray eel at, at Gray's Reef saying hello. Um, 
we'll touch on a few species. We won't be able to touch on a, a lot of them. There's just so many to talk about, but we'll talk generally about the types of species that are at Gray's Reef and what you would expect to see. So there are over 200 species of vertebrates, including fish and sea turtles. We have threatened and endangered species, such as the North Atlantic right whale, uh, several species of sea turtles, including the loggerhead, which is the most prevalent, uh, which are th uh, threatened or endangered species, and then the Atlantic sturgeon, which is also a uh, endangered species. So uh, all of these occur during different times of the year at Gray's Reef, as well as other uh, fish species. There are also over 900 species of invertebrates. This is what is really makes Gray's Reef a magical place when, to, when you see it. Um, all of these uh, colonies of invertebrates, um, both on the reef and in the uh, rocky outcrops and in the sand. So um, pretty amazing diversity, a lot of species. Uh, we're 19 miles offshore. So this uh, Gray's Reef is, is sort of unique in that way as well. There are a few offshore sanctuaries. Um, but Gray's Reef is exclusively offshore, 19 miles off the coast of Sapelo, which means not everyone can visit Gray's Reef. So it's important for us to sort of bring Gray's Reef to the people. And that's what I hope to do tonight a little bit um, and uh, get your interest in, in Gray's Reef and spread the word about its importance um, of this magical 22 square miles of hard bottom. It's also um, moderate depth. It's not uh, shallow and it's not super deep, so 60 to 70 feet deep. Um, but let me show you better than I can say. I can rattle off a lot of statistics about Gray's Reef, but let's just check out a little video and 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 hopefully um, you'll get to see what is what it's actually like. So hopefully you can hear this. All right, again, I hope that uh, came through. Let me just restart my presentation here. Okay, um, so of course video and you know, pictures um, say a, a thousand words, <laughs> more than I can tell you tonight about what the, how special this place is and all of the flora and fauna that, that exists there. So, um, but I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about management. Uh, so now from that exciting video to a little, a little less uh, exciting content, but I think it's important to share a, a little bit behind the scenes uh, of what, what goes on in the management of a sanctuary uh, such as Gray's Reef. Uh, basically, there are four major components of our management. The authorizing legislation, which is the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, hugely important. This is what enables uh, NOAA and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries to, to have sanctuaries, to designate sanctuaries, to um, expand and um, 
sanctuaries and, and implement regulations to manage them. So um, our regulations to implement these, the legislation are hugely important. We have national regulations as well as local regulations for Grace Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Our management plan, this is, uh, the last management plan was completed in July of 2014. And we are getting ready to start the process of updating our condition reports and begin the, the long process of updating our um, management plan by 2024. Um, so that's four years out, but it's gonna take all four years, I think, to, to gear up and, and to be effective and engage the public and stakeholders uh, to make sure that our management is effective and in incorporating um, the ideas and desires of the public as well. Now, permitting is also hugely important. So marine sanctuaries are not, um, it's kind of a misnomer, uh, the, the term sanctuary. It, it's a marine protected area with regulations, certainly, but some activities are allowed, uh, some explicitly through our regulations. So a grazed reef such as uh, fishing and diving are allowed. Uh, in certain areas. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our research area. But then other activities that can occur in the sanctuary sometimes need to be permitted to, to basically allow an activity that would otherwise be prohibited in the sanctuary. At Gray's Reef, we have really three main pillars of our management plan. Resource protection, scientific research, and education and outreach. Each of these are equally important. These pillars, uh, without one, the other would fall. Um, resource protection, as it might sound, is mostly about the management and conservation of the resources, while scientific research informs our management. So we work with partners, academic institutions, and state and other federal agencies to learn more about Gray's Reef. Uh, and not just Gray's Reef, but also in um, the ocean, in broader context of larger systems that are inter interacting with Grace Reef. And then education and outreach. So if no one knows about it, uh, knows about the work, if they don't know about the science that's coming out of sanctuaries, then all is um, lost, <laughs> all is for naught, all this hard work. So uh, education and outreach are hugely important, uh, especially in early education, uh, really uh, exciting uh, children to, to learn more about science and the ocean, uh, and the species that we all depend on. And of course, reaching the public well beyond uh, our coastal communities, reaching inland um, and hopefully across the country and even international. Uh, so our outreach is incredibly important. I'll talk now a little bit about resource protection. Um, a few of our goals uh, that we're, we're working on currently, uh, one is to really improve the understanding of ecological connectivity inside and outside the sanctuary. Uh, ecological connectivity, so what is that? Um, basically, as I mentioned earlier, Gray's Reef is 22 square miles. It's a representative sample of this uh, natural live bottom, hard bottom reef habitat. Uh, it is not the full extent of this, so uh, of this habitat. As I mentioned, it's extent, uh, this type of habitat extends from um, North Carolina to Cape Canaveral, Florida. So quite a large extent, but various conditions. Some areas are more heavily used by the public while other areas are less utilized. Gray's Reef is sort of in the middle. It gets quite a bit of fishing and, and some diving activity, um, but not because of its proximity to the shore, um, maybe a little less visitation than other areas might get. So it provides a really good um, example of an area that has moderate uh, human activity uh, in comparison to other areas that might have more or different environmental conditions, different oceanic uh, and physical conditions affecting that habitat. So we really want to understand at Gray's Reef how the habitat within the sanctuary uh, is in comparison to similar areas outside as well we want to understand how the species interact in this larger context. So I'll talk a little bit later about some of our research that uh, is helping us to understand that. We also monitor the physical and biological conditions to help inform management decisions. So everything from water quality, temperature, and so forth, as well as the species. Uh, and we protect these resources. So part of having that marine protected area sanctuary designation is to ensure that these resources will be here for future generations. 
Um, and so we have regulations um, and enforcement is also hugely important there. Making sure, you know, enforcement starts with education. Everybody, you know, just making sure everyone understands uh, what you can and can't do in a sanctuary and, um, and have responsible, fun um, enjoyment of those resources while, while you're at Grace Reef. The socioeconomic um, aspects of the work we do is also equally important. The impact of Gray's Reef and, and these resources, these habitats and species on the local coastal communities as well as beyond. You know, what really answering that question of what, how am I affected in the public in my community by um, a National Marine Sanctuary um, or the resources like the recreational fishing opportunities uh, or just the intrinsic values of it existing uh, and knowing that it's there for future generations. So what, you know, what does all that mean in terms of um, social and economic terms to the community? To help us better understand um, this connectivity, um, both inside and outside the sanctuary, we are undertaking a long-term project, really, um, recurring project to um, actively map or characterize and map the seafloor at Gray's Reef and in, in some areas outside the sanctuary as well. Um, as you can imagine, having a sanctuary 20 miles offshore and 60 feet deep, uh, you don't get to see that every day, right? So even uh, us at the sanctuary, we, we do not get to go out to Gray's Reef every day. Um, much less than we hope to. <laughs> and when we do, it requires a lot of time scuba diving uh, to actually see, um, see this resource firsthand. So it's not, it's not something that you can actively look at daily uh, and understand and interpret. So things like multispectral, um, multi-beam uh, habitat maps, these high definition seafloor mapping products are hugely important to us to manage uh, the resource. So the, on the bottom left there is actual um, uh, map of Grace Reef and what it looks like with the ledges and sandy bottoms and the interspersed habitat. So uh, we'll talk about those habitat types a little bit, but basically we have everything from flat and rippled sand to sparsely colonized bottom, live bottom, and then other densely uh, li uh, colonized live bottom as well. Visitor use, so again, continuing with resource protection. Uh, 20 miles offshore, again, I mentioned, we don't go offshore that often. Um, so we're not out there counting the numbers of uh, boats every day or the number of divers. Uh, some uh, National Marine Sanctuaries are, are very fortunate. They, they have sort of a, a front gate, a gateway community to the sanctuary where they are along the coast. Uh, at Grays Reef and other places like Flower Garden, Banks National Marine Sanctuary that are offshore, Understanding how many people and who and when uh, people are using the sanctuary is a little harder question. So it becomes uh, a challenge for us to use technology to help us answer that question so that we can make sure that our management is effective uh, and uh, conserving the habitat, but also considering uh, the impacts of the people that are affected by our regulations. So making sure that we have a nice, enjoyable uh, recreational opportunity while conserving the habitat. Our, we can't do this alone. Um, in the National Marine Sanctuary System, we have a, a, an established sanctuary advisory councils for each sanctuary. Um, Grays, the Grays Reef Nas, uh, National Marine Sanctuary Sanctuary Advisory Council was established in 1999. And the SAC, we call it, the Sanctuary Advisory Council is a community-based advisory group uh, consisting of representatives from various uh, user groups, government agencies, and the public at large. So this is, I can't understate the importance of the advisory council. Uh, th these are our eyes and ears, our conduit to uh, industries, to interest groups, to the public, um, to state and local governments. Uh, so, the, so the members of the advisory council are incredibly important, bringing their perspectives and representing their, uh, their communities and having a voice for those communities in uh, our public setting. So we have uh, meetings a few times a year, and sometimes we're able to come together, and lately we're not able to come together in person, so we have virtual uh, sanctuary advisory council meetings 
which works as well. Uh, so we're, we're actually getting used to that a little bit at Grace Reef. But, but really, you know, in my job, um, I, could, I can't do it without the advice of the Sanctuary Advisory Council. So incredibly important. Let's switch to scientific research. Um, Gray's Reef is, again, I, I mentioned 20, only 22 square miles, but what it is is a catalyst. That designation as a marine protected area in a sanctuary uh, is, it serves as a catalyst to really attract and focus resources uh, to help us understand these uh, questions that we have about how the habitat, the extent of the habitat, the condition of the habitat, the species, how, how well they're doing, um, how they're shifting with environmental conditions as they change, um, what are the impacts of um, you know, our human activities on a place like, like Gray's Reef. So our scientific research is incredibly important. And again, one of those three pillars of our management uh, so our, we're really happy that our investment in Grace Reef, both with our research vessels, we have two, and our dive capability, as well as our technical expertise, help catalyze and really attract and focus researchers on Grace Reef. Um, and, and this tells us, as I mentioned, not just about Grace Reef, but about these types of habitat that are, that are so um, widely, ex the wide extent across the South Atlantic Bight. The research area. So in December 2011, uh, we designated uh, the southern third, uh, about eight square miles of the sanctuary as a research area. Um, this is relatively unique as well. So if, if you know anything about the scientific method and, and scientific experiments, you know that a control is incredibly important. Um, while you may be, uh, you have several variables in your experiments, things that change, wherever you can hold something or control something with less change um, or less impact, it's hugely important to really understand uh, what, what we're seeing in our research. So the designation, designation of the research area was important to do just that, to establish a control area, uh, relatively lower uh, human influence. So uh, we're, we're, we cannot exclude things like water quality and marine debris and other factors that uh, humans contribute to that are, exist at Gray's Reef, but we can um, limit things like uh, take of those resources, of hard bottom resources uh, through fishing or diving, uh, and just limit the direct human interface with, with the resource in this area so that we can see and compare inside and outside the research area and not just within the sanctuary, but again, across this large extent of, of hard bottom habitat in the Southeast. Ongoing research. Uh, we have a lot going on at Gray's Reef. Um, again, we've, we serve as this catalyst, this focus uh, area for research, and we have a lot of partnerships with academic institutions across the Southeast and, and beyond. So. Uh, one, one study that's super interesting that's ongoing is our predator-prey interaction study. Uh, what you see there in the picture is a uh, time-lapse camera that, that is set out and takes pictures of fish interacting over a period of time to see what's going on. Again, you can't be out there and you can't scuba dive uh, for days on end, so you have to put devices out to help you be your eyes and ears. We'll talk a lot about those devices um, later in the presentation. But this one's really exciting and, and helps us better understand how predatory fish, both in the water column and on the bottom, the benthic species, interact with each other and with their prey species. Um, how they influence um, feeding, whether one species in the water column is affecting uh, predation on the bottom or vice versa, how they work together perhaps um, in, in a symbiotic way sometimes to, to uh, capitalize on prey. One of my uh, areas that I'm most intrigued with are is sanctuary soundscapes. Um, so ocean noise. Um, the ocean is a loud place. It is not a quiet place. Uh, there are so many sources of sound in the marine environment. Natural sounds like uh, snapping shrimp and, and uh, fish 
So a lot of fish communicate through um, uh, acoustic cues and grunts and clicks. Um, and so they make noise, but they also need to, to be able to hear that noise. It's one thing to transmit a sound, but being able to receive that sound is hugely important. So when, when anthropogenic noise or human caused noise is, um, impacts the species, we want to know that and understand how and, and how we can minimize that. Uh, so things like boats and, um, and other activities really influence um, that sound environment that these species rely on. So in the bottom left there, you'll see a picture of that's actually a hydrophone that uh, is mounted on the seafloor at Grace Reef and attracting quite a few spade fish, as you can see. <laughs> but um, really a hugely important device just to listen and understand what the soundscape is at Grace Reef so that we can, again, make sure that we have the best management in place to conserve these important species. Similarly, um, understanding fish movement and migration. So we use acoustic tags, slightly different technology. Um, on the top right there in the hand, um, you'll see that's the, the tag that's inserted into fish, various species of fish. And then those uh, emit sort of a, a pinging sound or a, a signature that's detected on these acoustic receivers that are placed all around the sanctuary and across this, the South Atlantic. I, there's a huge network of these devices up and down the coast. And that's hugely important to see how fish move during certain times of the year or in response to changes in conditions, including things like hurricanes. Uh, you know, what, what do fish do during uh, major storm events or when water quality is changed by heavy rainfall? What happens to those fish? Where do they go? Um, how do they escape predation during certain times of the year? Or where do they go during certain times of their life uh, cycle? So by tagging these fish, we get to see a little glimpse of, of their behavior and where they go. I mentioned the diversity. You know, Grace Reef what, is really neat in that these rocky outcrops get colonized by all these invertebrates, these sponges and soft corals, um, and really make a beautiful scene, uh, as you can see in the pictures but not only beautiful, but very functional and high value habitat. So it's important for us to learn how those invertebrates uh, use, uh, use the habitat, that, that rocky outcrop habitat, how, how they uh, recruit to the area and how they grow. Their settling rates, their death rates and growth rates are hugely important for us to understand so that we can uh, assess the impacts of our activities and see and know when something is not right. So if you don't know their normal growth rates and how they're supposed to look and, uh, and, and function, then uh, when something changes out there, you're gonna miss it. So this is, this is hugely important research and, and a project that we're working, again, long-term with Georgia Southern University on, uh, quite, a, quite an important project. Uh, one of our, I guess, most exciting times of the year <laughs> are our NOAA ship expeditions. So every summer, we try our best to get time on a NOAA ship, usually the Nancy Foster out of Charleston, to take us out on an expedition in and around the sanctuary. These expeditions can last several days to weeks, and we, we're able, when we get these NOAA white ships, like the Nancy Foster, we're able to take numerous partner scientists out with us so while we can host several scientists on our research vessels, like the Sam Gray or Joe Ferguson, um, when we get a large ship like this, we can do extended uh, research activities and have several activities uh, going on at the same time, both habitat mapping from the ship, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but also uh, diving-based uh, research. So in the 2019 expedition, we had several projects going on. And we are a little impacted by COVID-19 this year, so we're not going to be able to, most likely not going to be able to go out and do an in-person expedition. However, we are excited that hopefully the Nancy Foster uh, out of Charleston will be continuing some of that habitat mapping work that we were talking about. So uh, really important to us uh, working with our partners and the, and the NOAA ships. 
technology, um, again, being an offshore sanctuary, it's hugely important for us to be on top of technology and to leverage that technology as it emerges. At Gray's Reef, we're using all sorts of technology, everything from satellites um, and remote sensing. So when we put satellite tags on sea turtles, we're able to see their movements through um, their transmissions and, and, and through our satellite network. Uh, we also do, uh, I mean, you know, as I mentioned with visitor use, we're able to actually count boats uh, from space, which is really neat. See certain times of the year, how many vessels are out there and what perhaps they are doing. Um, not while not real life, real time, it does give us a snapshot, little windows, little sneak peeks of what's going on out there. Uh, we're really excited to work with partners uh, with technology like technologies like wave gliders, especially with our acoustic research. These can um, actively uh, record sound, so much like our hydrophones that are mounted on the bottom, as well as track, detect, and track fish movement, uh, as I mentioned in the other project as well. Remotely operated vehicles are something that we're, we are starting to um, get involved with, uh, again, to, to minimize our, our need to have to dive, to use other technologies to send down and perhaps do surveys or look at equipment and visually inspect equipment, uh, maybe even do maintenance on some maintenance on equipment in the future. So we're very excited to uh, be endeavoring in remotely operated vehicles and hope to have one coming our way soon. We're asked a lot at Gray's Reef and across the sanctuary system of how can I get involved? Um, it's not always straightforward to the public as to ways that if you can't visit a sanctuary or and, you, and it's not readily um, visible, you know, apparent as to how you can get involved, um, I just encourage everyone to reach out to us and our, our staff, and you can find our information online and ask. Uh, we have volunteer events throughout the year. Uh, again, right now, a little impacted by COVID-19, uh, but we're doing some virtual events and then hope to get, you know, at some point, get back on track with our more traditional um, ocean-oriented events and festivals and so forth. Um, you can join, if you're a diver, you can join our Team Ocean Divers uh, to help us with our research. So you can be a volunteer diver that's NOAA certified. And you can not only uh, become a member of the Sanctuary Advisory Council, if that's what you'd like to do, but you can participate. That's the important piece with the Sanctuary Advisory Council process. The public is invited. These are public meetings, and we welcome your uh, participation and, and contribution to our management through the Sanctuary Advisory Council. And then one of the biggest things you can do is, is follow us on our social media, our Facebook and Twitter. Um, support us that way virtually online and spread the word through social media about Grace Reef. So that's, again, that education and outreach uh, is, is hugely important. Uh, lastly, I wanted to uh, sort of plant the seed that, you know, we are planning for a Gray's Reef Expo in Savannah. Uh, originally, we were planning for that Memorial Day weekend, but that got uh, sidetracked with COVID. So we are hoping to have uh, some type of event, uh, whether it's the full-blown expo that we had planned for or a modification of that event in November, uh, the 21st and 22nd. So we're crossing our fingers that the... Uh, Plans are going to align to allow us to have an expo, uh, and again, to reintroduce um, Gray's Reef to the public and the coastal communities in Georgia. So keep, you know, put that on your calendar and, and, and cross your fingers that uh, this will be able to happen. We're super excited about it. But if it doesn't happen this fall, we're certainly going to be pursuing that uh, in the spring and summer of next year. So uh, again, super excited uh, to have big outreach events like that. And that is about all I have. I wanted to give uh, a big thanks from teams, Team Gray's Reef. Um, here are a few of our staff, um, posing by the Joe Ferguson there, our, one of our research vessels. So we're um, a small but mighty team of scientists and communicators, um, NOAA Corps, um, and, um, and fellows, uh, students as well. Lots of uh, volunteers and, and student participation in our staff. So. Um, we, we are all super busy, but also very excited to do more as much as we can 
uh, with this small and mighty staff. So again, thank you for having me tonight, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you. And with that, I open any questions that you may have. Happy to answer. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn my video back on. Um, I'm sure we all got a lot of information um, in formulating those questions. Um, before I turn everyone's mics on, we did get one question in the chat that from Karen. She wanted to know how the sanctuary got its name, specifically the Gray's part of the name. <laughs> Ah, great question. So Milton Sam Gray was a researcher um, that really um, made this part of our coast famous. Uh, he had an interest in, in the area and just explored and did research for many years. And so the Gray's Reef is, is in his namesake. So one of the, basically the pioneers of this hard bottom, live bottom habitat uh, off the coast of uh, the Carolinas and Georgia and um, really put really put it on the map. And so it's, it's in um, Sam Gray's honor, as well as that namesake is, a, is on our research vessel as well, the Sam Gray. Excellent. Um, we also got another question. Um, it, it comes from Alex. There has been talk and concerns about the National Marine Monuments being open for fishings in Maine. Um, sorry, how are the protections of the Maine sanctuaries different than the protections for our marine monuments? Sorry, I read that sure. right. Sure. <laughs> um, so I think I think what the issue, the question is about is um, the the main difference is Gray's Reef does not have commercial fishing activities within the boundaries. Uh, certainly, there are commercial fishing activities within relatively close proximity of the sanctuary, but not within the sanctuary boundaries. So in the monument, that was the main thing in the Northeast is that commercial fishing. Um, had been allowed, I think, at some point in time, and then was closed. Uh, I think it was species exactly. Um, so in our area, we don't have that that issue necessarily with commercial fishing um, and open or closed status of fisheries. Um, we have recreational fishing, which is more of the, as you can imagine, the private and charter type uh, fishing uh, that we, we have at, at Grace Reef, but but not the commercial activities. Okay, um, more questions are coming in, so thank you for putting them in the chat. So if you have them, we'll add them to the chat. You can type it, it should be at the bottom of your screen. Some of you might have at the top or side. But um, also, um, Chelsea, who did get in late, so she does apologize, but she was like, can, can you recap your research or your research of interest background? Can, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that question. Uh, may, um, and, um, Stan, I think you can also see these questions if you open the chat. So, um, so if I read them incorrectly, um, can, do you have a recap of your research? I think she's asking you in particular, or your research interest background. So maybe a little bit more about from you. Sure. Yeah. So I am um, not a researcher. <laughs> uh, I'm lucky to be in the superintendent position, which allows me to dabble in everything um, and try not to get in our in the way of our uh, professionals. We have scientific uh, experts on staff and our partners, which we hugely rely on. My background, I'm actually more of, um, I'm a biologist by, by training, um, but more of a policy person. So I spent most of my career in natural resource policy uh, and management. So uh, helping set the direction and, um, and, and really understand our progress in implementing management. So that's, um, I bring that skill again to this position as superintendent. Um, that, that, that's really what the position is about, is making sure that we're implementing our management strategy uh, the way that we intended and communicating that effectively. Um, but things that I'm interested in, um, you know, not just the ecological pieces, but I'm also interested in the cultural and maritime heritage of the area. Um, while Gray's Reef is not uh, designated or is designated for the uh, natural resources, the importance of these. There are other things as well that are hugely important. The socioeconomic aspects of the sanctuary, um, the cultural values that are found uh, in and around the sanctuary. So I'm also interested in that as well. Um, but threatened and endangered species. So I used to work for NOAA Fisheries uh, prior coming to, to coming into sanctuaries. And I worked as Endangered Species Act uh, consultation biologist on the regulatory side for a while. So um, understand, you know, that piece and the importance of conserving and protecting threatened and endangered species. 
uh, which we do have at Gray's Reef, uh, especially North Atlantic right whale, which is critically endangered. What, um, um, I have another question from Laura. She wants to know how is the information obtained from the mapping used? So. Ah, great question. So um, those map products, we are actually trying to maximize the utility of those. So right now, I mean, as you can imagine, these are massive data sets. Um, so that all that information that comes in has to be processed and, and to get to something to just like a, a two-dimensional map that, that I showed, that hyperspectral image of what the what Gray's Reef looks like. Um, but it can be used in different ways uh, as well. So we are trying to develop a 3D, three-dimensional rendering of that habitat map as well, so that we can then uh, use it not for education and outreach is one primary purpose, but also for our uh, resource protection and management, being able to have a three-dimensional view uh, and something that you can pivot and move and, and really see those uh, ledge heights and understand uh, not, only, not only the heights of the ledges, but how the things change over time as we take these images throughout time, uh, how the sand is ebbing and flowing and the depth or the height of these ledges are changing over time. So um, I, I think that uh, the imagery, like the, the habitat mapping can be useful for many things, um, from education outreach to, of course, informing our management. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, um, we want to give you such a big thanks for taking the time out to educate us all more about Gray's Reef and this wonderful resource that's right here on our coast that even though we all live here, again, we, it's not easy to get out there, but it's great to learn more about it. Um, so thank you all that are attending um, this program. And I realized I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. <laughs> um, my name is Stephanie Tuning, and I am the education coordinator here at 100 Miles. So you get lots of emails from me. Um, but please stay tuned. We are going to do some more webinars um, in our Naturals 101s. Um, series the rest of the summer. So stay tuned. We'll be advertising those on our website as well as Facebook. Again, social media is the easiest way to get most of this out. But we also will be posting this video up on YouTube on our YouTube channel um, in the coming days once we um, make it tight, tighten it up a little bit. So thank you all for joining us. But a big shout out to um, Stan Rogers for taking the time out and um, sharing all this information with us today. But on that note, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and that you stay safe and healthy. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.